I'm actually uh, very glad to be here talking to you today because um, this is the first time in a long time, several months, I got to sp speak to an audience of peers. And in fact, uh, Amplero, we actually just uh, spun the business out of a larger company. I just spent the last three months raising venture capital, including uh, one very interesting partner presentation. We actually presented to an audience that included a taxidermied full-size Komodo dragon on the boardroom table. So <coughs> this is a much uh, more fun audience, I would say. Kind of also perhaps a little less novel. <coughs> anyway, um, with Amplero, we leverage um, machine learning and multi on bandit experimentation to enable marketers to achieve what's not humanly possible. I'm going to tell you what that I think that means here shortly. And our platform dynamically tests thousands of marketing permutations to automatic automatically decide and execute on um, marketing interactions that maximize long-term uh, customer value. Our platform's live actually with a number of very interesting customers at pretty meaningful scale. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, real-world examples. So um, actually, John um, from SAP at the beginning of the day today uh, talked a little bit about uh, Wanamaker's dilemma. It's actually not clear that this statement is actually truly attributable to John Wanamaker. But anyway, the problem I think is very much alive today, which is half the money and effort that you spend on advertising or marketing is wasted. And it's really hard to figure out which half it is. <clears throat> so why is half the money wasted? Well, my contention is that there are misses on the three-legged stool of context. What do I mean by that? Well, I think the context in which a marketing act interaction occurs is a combination of three things. One, how it matches the customer's profile, how it matches the customer's behavior, when and where it's executed, what channel, what device, what location, what time, and then the experience that's actually delivered, the interaction that ha is presented to the customer. And so usually the misses or the lack of performance are attributed on one of these dimensions or another. So a couple of examples of uh, one, in this case, you know, addressing the wrong customer. In this case, perhaps um, mistiming the execution or perhaps misjudging the channel to interact with people on in a bad situation. And then perhaps just hitting the cus right customer at the right time, but with a message that just doesn't appeal. This actually was a very controversial Motrin ad that blew up on social media a few years ago. Um, Mums really like the baby Bjorn. I love the baby Bjorn with my kids too, and this message was kind of offbeat with that. So thinking about misses in marketing and the misattribution of spend being related to misses on one or more of these sort of dimensions on what comprises true context of a marketing interaction with the consumer. And we've also talked in this track a number of times today about the disruption that's happening um, in the industry and across many different categories as we move from sort of driving transactions to having ongoing relationships with consumers and actually managing services and subscriptions. And so to actually enable those sort of um, that transition from driving the next transaction to driving months of engagement with the consumer, you have to take different approaches to how you market. <coughs> and this really is the domain uh, that we're working with Amplero, which is customer lifetime value marketing. It's kind of long-term marketing. <coughs> and the goal is to create an ongoing relationship with customers that actually shift away from current transactional sort of focus. And so we send messages to customers of service providers with millions of consumers. <coughs> and a couple of key verticals we focus on, telecom, subscription software, gaming, financial services. And the channels of communication are primarily not um, display or social media, sort of paid for media. It's owned um, media. So it's emails I can send. It's notifications I can provide in my own application. It's interactions I can have when a customer's logged into my portal. It's pull interactions when a customer calls my customer care or enters my retail stores. <clears throat> and large enterprises employ teams of hundreds of data scientists, analysts, marketers in this sort of um, activity. And they buy platforms that the licenses cost tens of millions annually. And in this domain, Wanamaker's dilemma is truly alive and well. <clears throat> so this is an example of a, an onboarding campaign at one of our telecom customers one of the big four here in the US. They, um, the purpose of this uh, strategy, marketing strategy that's called Nurture Newcomers, is to engage customers in their first month of tenure, two months of tenure, to really get hooked on 4G data, 
which as we kind of know in the US market is really the key dimension on which we sort of ladder how we pay for our mobile subscription in terms of how much data we consume. So the target audience is the first 30 days of tenure. It's directed at customers from monthly plans. They have data capable handsets. They don't have other packs and promotions. So there's quite a narrow sort of target audience dimension to this campaign. And then there's a very rich incentive that's applied. It's two months of unlimited 4G data. Uh, so it's a very expensive for the mobile operator incentive. But of course, they've got quite a confined target audience. <coughs> we also actually have eight different message creatives, eight different experiences that they send to the customer that actually message this incentive. Um, but Wanamaker's dilemma is alive and well here. The mean lift of this campaign is actually 0.1% in terms of overall revenue. But if you can measure what's going on, which of course over the last decade or so, a number of the people in this room have pioneered some of the measurement techniques to do this. You can actually see that in fact across those eight messages, there's huge disparity in how they perform. Actually these are a few 150 character text messages. You wouldn't think, and they're messaging the same incentive to the same target audience. You wouldn't believe the disparity in performance that there is in them. But you can see if you peel the onion, big difference here. However, it turns out there's a lot more to it, even for that purple, the best message there. Um, it actually can be made to perform nearly uh, five times better if you target it to customers on the right price plan, who have the right structure of how they pay, who call and text internationally without buying packs, who have high outbound voice page ranks, so they're influential in their social graph. The problem is, when you're designing customer lifetime value marketing experiments, how do you actually know all this and design it into your experiments up front? It's impossible. <clears throat> and so, particularly when you're acting in this scenario early in the customer lifetime, life cycle, how can you actually learn fast enough and develop findings and act on them uh, quickly enough that you can uncover what you should do and how best to interact with those customers? And so my contention is that the reason that Wanamaker's Dilemma is kind of alive and well today is that scalably making discoveries like this and act, acting upon them is not humanly possible. So you can't do this with a team of 100 marketing operations and BI analysts. You actually have to do something different. <clears throat> so we're doing something different with Amplero, <clears throat> and there are kind of four key tenets to our approach. One is we have a longitudinal representation of the um, consumer's relationship with the enterprise. So in the case of our telecom customers, we have every call, text, data session they have on their device. We have every care interaction, every um, <clears throat> retail interaction, every purchase that they make, every device migration. And we lay that out over time, which allows us to do interesting sequence-based analytics and look for evolving patterns of behavior. We loop that in with an experimental capability that allows us to measure thousands of combinations of interaction, thousands of contexts, essentially, um, in which customers can interact. And we couple that into a bandit-driven decisioning process. So we actually have the experimental measurement and the execution of our marketing interactions dynamically optimized and online. And then uniquely, we actually focus the optimization not on whether a customer clicks the email or opens the message or takes a specific offer, but actually downstream. Uh, it's very common for us to optimize, for example, 45-day revenue or 60-day user engagement. So we kind of have a passive view of what we're optimizing. And of course, it means we can directly optimize long-term business benefit. So how do we go about this? <clears throat> so CLV has typically been managed by, historically, by marketing to customer segments. So we're kind of used to looking in the customer base and discovering unique segments of behavior or profile or device or consumption, and then react profiling them developing marketing assets towards them and reacting to them. More recently, in the last five years, with the rise of marketing automation, um, it's become much more easy to create more elaborate rule sets, a more uh, narrow micro segments of audience, but again, they're hand curated. This works very well when you have um, customer bases like Marketo in a B2B situation, you're working with enterprises who have tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of customers. And when you get to a B2C business, um, Microsoft Office 365 would be an example. You know, they have hundreds of millions of uh, customers. And you try and manage rules for, for segments of those customers that are small enough that they get good marketing performance, the complexity explodes. And so thinking about um, 
consumer-facing businesses that have really um, excelled in managing the long-term value of their relationships with the customers, you know, the, one of the commonalities if they, is they've made put machine learning at the very core of their platforms. So the way customer value management works today is through this launching a campaign has this sort of sequence of events to it. I, I plan the strategy, the campaign I'm going to go after. So I identify the problem and the KPI that defines the problem, perhaps in my Teradata data warehouse. I do that with my marketer and my, and my marketing analyst. Then I develop a target audience against that KPI. Um, and I'll use some conventional tools for doing some BI sort of modeling. And I come up with some targeting conditions. And I build some predictive models. Then I engage the marketing creative, the digital agency, and they may help me design some emails or some display ads or some text message wording, some push notifications. Then I'm back to my analysts and I'm designing the marketing experiment. I'm designing some A-B tests I'm going to execute. Then I run them. Then I analyze how well they worked. And then if I'm lucky, I get the chance to make some optimization decisions. And you see, ideally, I end up with kind of one to five different messages I can send to a customer and target audiences that are defined by tens of sort of targeting rules that I can manage as humans and configure in the tools that are available today. And so the whole pace of this is about two to three months. So think of our tele telecom customers in particular, what's happening in the US. T-Mobile launches a new uncarrier program about on this cadence. So if you're a competitor to T-Mobile, you can actually learn about how to respond to the last T-Mobile offer about on the time frame they're going to launch the next one. So this is pretty much useless. What we do with Amplaro is cut out the stages after plan and design. So what Amplaro does is it actually dynamically manages a portfolio of marketing interactions that are happening with consumers all the time. Marketers continue to use their creativity to plan and design the marketing assets go off of the particular KPI problems, um, and they inform the with, with marketing, analytics, and BI. But it's an ongoing process. And what Amplero does is it continually executes the experimental design, the testing, the analysis, and takes the optimization decisions to continually improving the performance of the marketing that's happening. And of course, it flows out what it's learning back in to inform the marketer's planning and design of marketing assets. So how does this flow? Uh, as I talked about earlier, Amplero sort of plugs into this transactional um, exhaust about the relationship between the enterprise and the consumer. And it plugs into the enterprise's ongoing BI activity and predictive modeling. Then it has kind of two flows of machine learning. And I call this top flow the, the little m and the little l. So in here, essentially, Amplero has a configured and then deployed in an unsupervised fashion portfolio of behavioral analytics that acts on this longitudinal representation of customer behavior. So the cool thing is it actually explodes the number of dimensions on which you can consider unique contexts in which you may or may not interact with the consumer. On the other side of it, the marketers who are used to uh, defining targeting rules for marketing campaigns instead set the sanity constraints for each marketing asset or offer for when it actually makes sense to send to a customer from a customer experience perspective or from an economics perspective. And that essentially defines an outer bounding box within which Amplero can be begin to explore. <clears throat> so Amplero begins to send messages that are acceptable customer experiences. It has this high dimensional view of customer execution and the marketing content context. And is begin then able to begin to see downstream KPIs. So I mentioned 45 day revenue, 60 day engagement. 90-day retention. And it has an, learns then an online decisioning model that we're going to talk about in some detail. And that's where the big M and L and some optimization come in. So you have an online decisioning capability then that's dynamically optimizing these long-term KPIs. And the, transform to the transformation to this flow of what happens when you're doing customer value management with Amplero is essentially that the number of competencies that have to be involved goes significantly down. The breadth of tool sets that you use actually goes down significantly. And you actually increase the throughput of your marketing activity by, by about three orders of magnitude. It's about two orders of magnitude in terms of the breadth of number of distinct contexts, behavioral contexts, execution contexts, creative contexts you can explore. 
and another order of magnitude in terms of the pace of which you're learning. So the machine learning with a capital M and a capital L. <clears throat> I say that because I'm so used to um, coming into contact with businesses where they think they're going to bolt some machine learning on the side of what they've built. And of course, everyone in here knows you have to build a platform from the ground up that's designed to do these sorts of things. <clears throat> So as we look at it, the measurement component of doing this, <coughs> essentially Ampera ex executes randomized controlled trials. And it essentially compares target and control uh, experiences by context. So it has this view of the underlying context of the customer in which a target was sent or decided to be controlled and quantifies a lift, effectively a lift distribution by looking at pairwise comparison of targets and controls in context. And then it takes a multi-arm bandit approach to how it reasons with different distinct contexts and how it models how each of those contexts will potentially perform in terms of the lift they will get. <coughs> and so the nice thing, as everyone knows in here about the multi-arm bandit, is you have a nice trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So as you have lift distributions that you know are constrained and you're quite confident, you actually exercise those um, if they're positive frequently, and if there are situations where you're uncertain, you also exercise those frequently. But what we do, because we have this very high dimensional space of context, is we actually could learn a compression of that space using decision trees. And what that allows us to do is learn a multitude of distinct segments of the population in a single model, and generalizes our learning over user attributes and message or creative sort of attributes. And it means that for a given particular marketing experience you may have with a customer, you actually have, can have a distinct segmentation of the population for that experience. But we all know problems with single decision trees, particularly in terms of variation. And so we actually use a bagging approach. <clears throat> so we have a multitude of trees that we combine for each particular set of decisions we make about a given subscriber allows us to make a very unique decision uh, for each customer, but reduce the variance and avoid overfitting. So the way this plays out is at any given time, we have the latest behavior of a customer, the latest context of a customer, and there are a number of customer experiences that meet the constraints the marketer has set. So there are user attributes and there are experiences that will be valid for a customer to receive, that set of user attributes. So for each tree in a bag, we play those attributes and the user parameters down through the tree, and it defines for us a unique multi-arm bandit. So we essentially have a bag of unique multi-arm bandits for every user which we're about to make decisions on what marketing interaction they could receive. And then of course we're able to make a decision about the particular experience they get by sampling from those lift distributions that we have from the, from the multi-arm bandit. So it sounds kind of theoretically straightforward or relatively straightforward, but as we all know, when you actually get into engineering these solutions, it's never a happy path. So we actually spent quite a lot of time trying to decide about whether we were going to model target uh, KPI distributions and control KPI distributions and difference them, or whether we were going to model lift distributions by pairing targets and controls in context, ended up doing the latter. We spent quite a lot of time exploring that. <clears throat> Having done that, the good news was, and this is back in late 2014 with our first customer, we actually did the experimentation phase with the model. We switched it on. We started getting very significant revenue lift. Then there was an operational hiccup and data stopped flowing. Lift went down. We thought, that's great. There's causality about us getting lift. <clears throat> so when we resumed, we actually trained the next bag of trees, took it live and our lift started going gently but monotonically down. Fun times. And so after a lot of exploration, <clears throat> what we found, and actually this is something someone had mentioned to me more than a decade ago about a different company and a different problem, but what happens when you're acting in a system and the entire system is acting on the predictions that you're making. So you know we, we're very conditioned to think about static predictive models this is not a static predictive modeling situation because the data that you trained your model on is not, does not come from the same environment into which you're executing your model. In fact, the environment is impacted by the execution of your model. <clears throat> and 
And so what we found essentially is we needed to build our models in a way that reflected the effect of the intervention that are going to happen. And again, someone else mentioned today <coughs> reading uh, Pearl's book, Causality. And so we made a reversion back to causality and some of Pearl's do calculus, and I think we cracked it. <coughs> we came across this correction that we kind of call reconditioning. And uh, the pathological example for this is I have two messages, two marketing interactions I have. One of them works when, well for males, one of them works well for females. <coughs> so when I randomly execute those messages, of course I can learn the differentiated performance of them for males and females. Now when I then act on that learning, what happens of course is I mainly send the first message to males, I mainly send the second message to females, and it looks like every time I send the first message and the second message, they both always work. And so what happens is in my first phase of optimization, I get great performance. But then the training data that I use comes from that first phase of optimization. It looks like message one and message two, every time they're sent, they always work. And of course, my next model doesn't learn this gender-based differentiation of the messages. So when I, of course, act on knowing that effect, I can recover the lift that I had. But this effect is essentially born out here. You'll see a, you'll see a heat map. So this is during this initial learning phase. I'm sending the messages uniformly at random. Then in my first optimization phase, I send the two messages, the first one just to males, the second one just to females. And the performance looks way better. And so what I learn is every time I send message one, it works great. And every time I send message two, it works great. So I should just uniformly send message one and message two. Anyway, problem solved. So before and after at a real customer. <coughs> so um, in this case, this is the same nurture newcomer strategy with the eight different uh, messages here in play. And you'll see that this line is before and after optimization. There are three particular messages that the system has really begun emphasizing sending. We also actually see later that it varies over time. And of course, that's because it's getting bandit updates and it's online getting feedback. But this one particular message, the one which was the purple one in my original example that performed the best, um, actually is really getting some significant emphasis. And actually, the 45-day revenue lift that that message is getting has actually increased about uh, five or six fold <coughs> between the test and learn phase and the optimized phase. And for that one message, it's automatically, because of what Ampere has learned, getting sent preferentially to the heaviest data users, customers on the highest rate plan, users who heavily send international SMS, and users who have the highest um, voice calling page rank. So for this one particular message, you see we actually learned all the dimensions which impacted how well it performed. It's 6x roughly the performance of that message in terms of revenue generation. So that's one micro example. And we could say, OK, we'll send our BI team off to go and do some uplift modeling on that one campaign or example but you can't get that to scale. <clears throat> For this one uh, customer of ours, um, in the customer segment and brand we're working with, they have 12 million consumers. This is the incremental revenue performance this year of applying Amplero to their customer base to do this marketing. <clears throat> so what's our aspiration? <clears throat> it's that the new statement is, None of the money I spend on marketing is wasted. Most of it's spent on addressing customers in contexts that work, and the rest is spent on continually experimenting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.